Welcome to the session. Welcome everyone to the session on eye health an underestimated global health challenge. Innovations in eye health to achieve universal health coverage. I am Dr. Babar Qureshi. I'm the Director, Inclusive Eye Health and Neglected Tropical Diseases for Christian Blind Mission. And I'm very pleased to welcome you on behalf of the co-hosts of this session, which is which are the Christian Blind Mission, the International Agency for Prevention of Blindness, the German Ophthalmological Society, and the Lancet Global Health Commission on Global Eye Health. We have a session which is divided into two sections. The first sections, or the first section is with four speakers, four very eminent speakers. And they would be making an eight minute presentation each. And that's going to be followed by a panel discussion of some very distinguished guests that we have this morning. And I would also urge all of you to please send in your questions through the Q&A chat in the Zoom function that you already have, so that we'll be able to take up a few questions at the end from the participants of this session. I think with this little introduction, uh, I really look forward to this wonderful morning uh, session on eye health today. I'm very pleased to announce our first speaker. That's um, Dr. Mrs. Alako Caesar. She is the unit head at the World Health Organization in Geneva and leads the agendas on vision, hearing, and disability. Prior to this, she was the professor of medical psychology at the Faculty of Social and Human Sciences at the University of Southampton in the United Kingdom. Dr. Lakos, you're welcome. Thank you, thank you, Baba. And uh, I'm excited to be here with all of you today from the World Health Organization. And to talk about uh, the relevance of eye care as part of universal health coverage. And you know, when uh, I talk in front of, of an audience about the relevance of eye care, usually it is easy to make the case because I can assume with a lot of confidence that at least 50% of the audience wear glasses or contact lenses, lenses and can imagine very, very well what would be their situation if they would not have access to these eye care interventions. And, um, can imagine very well how difficult everyday life would be. And imagine this is the case of 800 million people who have vision impairment due to refractive errors and do, have not, do not have access to a simple intervention like uh, glasses. It is also the case and the experience of uh, at least 100 million people who experience vision impairment or blindness due to cataract and have not have access yet to a cataract surgery. And the reason why I portray the example of these 900 million people is because their lack of care could be addressed we would be able to provide two of the most cost-effective interventions in the health sector, classics and cataract surgery. So we are really letting down nine, at least 900 million people around the world. And we are letting down all these people around the world, but I, we are also letting down really society as a whole. And again, to bring the simple example of 
refractive errors and the loss of productivity that society experiences because people have not access to a simple glass of um, pair of glasses. Glasses. It is about or the about two hundred billion. And potentially, to some of you, this sum does not sound so enormous when we compare uh, to other loss of productivity in other area. But imagine the cost for closing this gap would be not even 25 billion. So we are letting people down and we are letting society down by not acting. And if you imagine the situation of people who experience vision impairment and blindness due to refractive errors and cataract, imagine all of those that we know of a millions of people who have, who experience vision impairment or blindness due to conditions who need more sophisticated interventions. We can talk about macular degeneration, diabetic retinopathy or glaucoma. And the question that we need to ask ourselves is, how can this be? How can really let down in this way people around the world and society? And this was the question that we address at the war, in the World Report on Vision. And of course, there are many factors that lead to this situation, but there is one key that we identify in the World Report on Vision, and that is the lack of integration of eye care services in the global health agenda and the global health services. In many, many countries of the world, still eye care is not part of the conversation of universal health coverage when Interventions are decided, or the what interven or the, the interventions are decided that need to be funded without out-of-pocket payment. And this, despite knowing that uh, eye care interventions are basic and essential interventions that everyone should receive. And this is because related to the lack of integration and having moved forward the ICANN agenda in a more parallel fashion and not in an integrated way. There is, however, good news today that I would like to reflect on. The first one, we have a new commitment from ministries of health from around the world, a new World Health Assembly resolution that put the accent on eye care being integral part of universal health coverage. And that is the recognition of ministries of health. We also have an eye care sector that is very mature. An eye care sector where we can find the most cost-effective interventions of the whole health sector, as I have mentioned before. A sector that has a long tradition of public health, a sector that has a very powerful and coordinated advocacy, also a sector that has a very strong public private sector that needs to be coordinated with the public sector and also a sector where there is a lot of technology and innovation, as we have seen also during COVID-19. We also have more and more technical tools. And I need, want to refer to those technical tools that WHO is developing and that we support that integration. Let me mention two of them. The first one, is a package of eye care interventions that will be fundamental for the discussion 
in the context of the decisions of universal health coverage, and also a toolkit on myopia that will facilitate this, con this conversation of integration of the eye care sector in the global uh, um, um, health agenda. And we have a commitment from ministries of health. But today, and from this year, we also have a commitment at the level of um, head of states. And we have a UN General Assembly resolution on vision. And both ministries of health and heads of states have put, forward, have put forward a commitment to action and to monitoring the progress that we are doing in the eye care sector. They have put forward this commitment by endorsing two targets for the eye care sector. 30% increase of ineffective coverage of cataract surgery and 40% increase in effective coverage of refractive error. But the significance of this commitment to action and to monitoring relies also in the fact that ministries of health and head of states have endorsed those global targets, not only to strive change and progress in the eye care sector, but also as a means for progress toward achieving universal health coverage. And in both the resolutions, in the one endorsed by ministries of health and the one endorsed by health of states at the UN, recognize these two global targets and the indicators to monitor them indicators that need to be integrated into the monitoring of universal health coverage. It's a message to advance universal health coverage through eye care. And at this point, there is only one more message to say. Please, let's get it done. Let's advance universal health coverage through advancing integrated people-centered eye care. We owe it to the millions of people around the world that need eye care and today do not receive it. Thank you, Baba. Back to you. Thank you very much, Alakos. Thank you for giving us the good news of the uh, two milestone resolutions of the World Health Assembly and of the United Nations, and the global commitment to universal health coverage and the targets that have been accepted. I think this has been a very unique development in the field of eye health, which is unprecedented. Thank you. With this, um, let me invite our next speaker, that is uh, Professor Matthew Burton. Professor Matthew Burton is the director of the International Center for Eye Health at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. He's also the co-chair of the Lancet Global Health Commission on Global Eye Health and led the global the Global Lancet Commission paper that we all read on eye health. Professor Burton. We don't hear you. Hi. Yeah. Is that OK? Yeah, we can hear you now. Please go ahead. Great. Thank you very much for this opportunity to address you today at this meeting of the World Health Summit. This is a pivotal time for eye health. Last year was the culmination of the Global Initiative Vision 2020, the framework for the last two decades. And as we've just heard from Alarcos, in 2019, WHO published the World Report on Vision. In 2020, the World Health Assembly passed the resolution on vision. And in July of this year, the United Nations General Assembly passed its first resolution on vision. In February of this year, the Lancet Global Health Commission on Global Eye Health was published. 
The Commission report is the work of an interdisciplinary group of 73 academics and national programme leaders and practitioners from 25 countries. Building on the WHO World Report and Vision, the Commission analysed many aspects of eye health in 2020 and beyond. Today, I'd like to share with you some of the high level findings from the Commission, which I hope will be useful in advancing and catalyzing action. The Commission explores eye health from several different perspectives, the broad importance of eye health, the scale of the challenge, the economics of vision, the research needed, and finally, looking beyond 2020, delivering high quality eye care for all. The Commission uh, examined the importance of eye health from several perspectives, including its impact on quality of life, general health and well-being, and mortality. Our starting point was a systematic review of the published literature for studies of the relationship between interventions to improve eye health and the impact of this on the sustainable development goals. Briefly, we found evidence that the provision of eye care services is associated with improvements in workplace and economic productivity, household consumption and income, and employment. The resulting economic benefits, particularly when delivered in resource limited settings, contribute to advancing the SDGs on poverty, SDG 1, food security, SDG 2, and decent work, SDG 8. For example, a trial showed that the provision of free spectacles for tea workers with near vision impairment in India improved workplace productivity by 22%. Educational performance is linked to vision. Children with vision impairment have poorer educational outcomes and are more likely to be excluded from schools. We found evidence that providing spectacles to children improves their educational outcomes, supporting quality education, SDG4, with effect sizes at least as large as other health care interventions. Improved education is crucial for development, reducing poverty and hunger, and enabling work, so SDGs 1, 2 and 8. Women carry a greater proportion of vision impairment than men, and so addressing vision impairment and improving eye health is relevant to both gender equality and reducing inequalities in general. A study from Kenya, Bangladesh and the Philippines found that people with vision impairment from cataract were poorer and reported a lower quality of life than their neighbours. One year after cataract surgery, this gap was gone, with no difference in the markers of poverty, such as household expenditure. SDG 3 and SDG 11 include targets to reduce road traffic injuries, a leading cause of death in children and young adults. Multiple studies report associations between some eye conditions and motor vehicle collisions, whereas cataract surgery leads to reduced driving difficulties and fewer collisions. Globally, healthcare contributes around 5% of greenhouse gas emissions. Eye care as a high volume service is probably a significant contributor to this. The Commission found limited research on the environmental impact of eye healthcare delivery. However, we noted that practices and their environmental costs can vary substantially, suggesting opportunities to reduce the environmental impact of eye healthcare delivery, which requires further research. Impaired vision and eye health can have a broad impact on general health and well-being, SDG 3. In a series of analyses, we mapped out the complex connections between eye health and general health. Impaired eye health has widespread direct impact, for example, exacerbating depression and dementia, increasing cardiovascular disease risk through reduced physical activity, and increased risk of injuries. Encouraging evidence indicates that interventions improving eye health can benefit general health. For example, cataract surgery can slow the rate of cognitive decline in dementia. Vision impairment and eye health are often perceived to have little effect on mortality. This figure summarizes the findings of a systematic review and meta-analysis performed by the Commission of population-based longitudinal cohort studies reporting vision impairment and all-cause mortality. We found clear evidence of increased mortality risk with increasing severity of vision impairment. When compared 
comparable studies were compared, the mortality rate of mild vision impairment or worse was 1.3 times, for moderate or worse, 1.4 times, and for severe, it was 1.9 times. Our overall conclusion is that improving eye health and reducing vision impairment is an important, if not essential, enabler to the achievement of the SDGs. In this diagram, the solid green arrows radiating out from improved eye health indicate direct effects and the black arrows indirect benefits. We found evidence that the provision of eye care services is associated with improvements in economic and productivity and income, advancing poverty reduction, general health and well-being, educational outcomes, and reduced inequalities. As part of the work of the Commission, we explored aspects of the economics of vision. We developed a new estimate for economic productivity loss attributable to vision impairment using the latest data on the number of people with unaddressed distance vision impairment in 2020, the latest World Bank GDP data from 2018, employment rates, and the relative reduction of employment amongst people with vision impairment. We estimated a global annual productivity loss of $411 billion. The Commission updated the cost effectiveness analyses for cataract surgery and refractive error services from several world regions, which together account for around 90% of unmet need. The good news, as Alakas mentioned, is that both are highly cost effective interventions. The Commission has 10 key messages in summary. However, our most important message can be found on the front cover. Investing in universal eye health is a realistic, cost-effective way of unlocking human potential by improving health and well-being, education, work and the economy. It is essential to achieving the Sustainable Development Goals. So in summary, the Commission seeks to reframe eye health as not only a health matter, but also as an enabling cross-cutting issue within the Sustainable Development Framework. We believe the evidence in favour of urgent global action on our health is now compelling. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Matthew. Thank you. That was a great achievement. Um, having been part of this, I think it was an extremely huge task to bring it all together and actually bringing eye health into the whole development agenda. And I think this paper really made a significant addition to our knowledge generally of what's happening. So thank you very much, Matthew. So these two uh, presentations have given us a broad global perspective of what is happening within the sector of eye health, the commitment to eye health and its development into the development agenda. The next two presentations are going to be looking at the field level. How do we implement this innovatively when we take all these things that we've heard this morning into the field? And the first presenter uh, on the next piece of these presentations is um, Dr. Andrew Bastavos who is the CEO um, and co-founder of Peak Vision UK. And he's also the associate professor at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. Andrew, we're very happy to have you. Thank you, Baba. Thank you everyone for listening in. Um, I'd like to build on the amazing work that Alarcos and Matthew have shared. Um, and to begin with, just to share the story of Mama Philip, who's a grandmother who's been blind for 10 years from cataract, one of the hundreds of millions of people that Alarcos mentioned have a curable, reversible condition. Uh, and the knock-on effect is beyond her own life. Here's her grandchild no longer in school, acting as her eyes. So the impact of vision is, is huge, both on an individual, family and societal level. And Mama Philip is representative of the many people who have an unmet eye health need that has been beautifully articulated and described in the work of both the World Report on Vision and the Lancet Global Health Commission that shows of the 1.1 billion people 
today with an unmet need. Now, in the same time that this data has been gathering, the world has moved through a technological revolution to the point that four in every five people on the planet today own a connected smartphone. That's 6.3 billion people. And that was the motivation many years ago for the development and testing of Peak. Peak is a validated evidence-based tool to try and meet those needs of those who have an unmet eye health need. I'm just going to touch briefly on some of the validation of the work that's been done to date. So the first is the validation of a mobile app to measure visual acuity in the hands of non-eye health workers, enabling greater reach and access in communities and schools. And it's been validated against standard uh, measures that would be used in trials, proved to be as accurate and repeatable as clinical standards, and faster to deliver than both. The mobile app is globally available for free. It's currently being used in 190 countries um, and has been uh, proven in multiple systematic reviews since. But measuring vision alone doesn't solve the problem. It's, it's integration into programs and care that is critical. And so we've been utilizing this in school eye health programs and in a cluster randomized control trial in Kenya, we were able to demonstrate that many children in any given school context have a vision impairment, but they're difficult to identify. And if a expensive resource in the eye health system, such as an ophthalmic nurse, has to go and identify them, they are typically leaving the hospital setting to go and, and provide that assessment, which is hard to justify when maybe 90% of those don't have a problem. And so what we were able to test was was it possible for a teacher to roam around schools and identify those children with a vision impairment so that the ophthalmic nurse could then assess them? And we were able to show they could do it reliably and also connect those who had been found with a problem to their parents via personalised SMS and also to the service provider in real time to close the loop so that the hospitals would know how many are due to come uh, and whether or not they had uh, arrived. And in the initial trial, 21,000 children were screened, 900 were identified with a vision impairment, and that was delivered by 25 teachers in nine days. And critically, we were able to determine what proportion of the school children were identified with a problem, how many of them required a service, and then critically, how good was the quality of referral? So of those that turned up, how many were appropriate referrals, so not causing extra stress on the system, and most importantly, how many made it? Or to look at it another way, who didn't? Who was left behind? And only once we see who is being left behind can we start to transform that situation. That data was then utilized to expand the program to 200,000 children and has now recently been included in as, a, as an example within the National Eye Health Strategic Plan in Kenya. And together with our partners, CBM and the Ministry of Health, uh, the program is to be rolled out in seven counties beginning next year. We've also taken this further in a randomized control trial in India, where the, the proposition was very similar, but we wanted to go one step further. So of those children identified in schools, we looked at the proportion that had a refractive error. We then were able to track how many received glasses and at an unannounced visit three months later, what proportion of the children were still wearing their glasses. And that meant the entire impact chain could be understood because so much of it can come down to cultural or societal barriers to access as well as identification and service barriers. And finally, in a similar trial before the community, more, most recently published in the Lancet Digital Health, we were able to triple the proportion of people accessing care and, and change the utilization of hospital services from the majority of those prior to the program getting primary eye care services in the hospital and only 8% receiving cataract and refractive error services to a change in the proportion so that most of that specialist capacity was utilized for the priority conditions. And so that uh, evidence base has been translated into our impact chain so that we can identify the people like Mama Philip who in reality live amongst a, a broad population of people um, with an unmet need. And so our data has been used to help identify those in the population with an unmet need, determine which proportion of them have been identified either through screening or sensitization, how many have been connected to treatment, and then to follow up how many receive the outcome that's been desired. And that data can be disaggregated to better understand those being left behind in real time 
and also look where to intervene. So in this example, where half of those reaching treatment from referral is increased to 75%, rather than 40 out of 100 getting treatment, 60 do, and rather than 30 out of 40, getting the outcome, 45 do. And so that has been used now to build a, a suite of services, starting with a population-based survey tool known as the Rapid Assessment of Avoidable Blindness, which helps provide those key metrics that Alarcos was describing in terms of coverage of the population uh, who've re reached services and also effective coverage. And it can do that now both for cataract and refractive errors. And then finally, the things that have been used to monitor and improve services using those metrics that matter, getting people from identified to the desired outcome are being offered through a suite of solutions called Peak Solutions, which is broadly made of two components. Peak Capture, which is a smartphone app that supports the eye health screening referral pathway to treatment, and Peak Admin that configures that pathway and tracks the data in real time. The programs are supported by partnering with local implementing partners on the, on the journey that patients go under, adapting a software workflow that follows that pathway, and then supporting with data analysis to gain insights around who's been left behind. And this could happen in a, a school setting or a community setting. And when anyone is identified with a problem, they're connected to the appropriate point in the service pathway so that those with a non-met need are being understood at a population level so that service provision can be targeted towards them. To date, we have partners across the globe led by our anchor partner, CBM, working in multiple countries. And we're starting to share our learning and insight across those programs so that people like Mama Philip are no longer left behind. And very pleased to say that when Mama Philip was able to access her cataract treatment, this was the outcome the next day. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Andrew. Thank you. Um, CBM has partnered with Peak um, and taken Peak as a tool on a public health scale. And uh, I can certainly say that it has improved uh, the reach and to the number of people we reach. But more importantly, it has improved the reach to people who are unreached. You can actually track those people who who do not get the treatment that is required and something that Alakas alluded to this morning. So it's a very helpful tool. Thank you, uh, Andrew, for that. Um, moving on, uh, diabe diabetes and diabetic retinopathy are pretty important diseases and actually one of the upcoming blinding disease that we really need to focus on as we go forward. And looking forward, what are the innovative ways that people are employing at the moment in the field where diabetic retinopathy is already becoming quite a massive problem? I'm very pleased to invite um, Dr. Bibi Rafin Talpur from the Sindh Institute of Ophthalmic Vision Sciences in Pakistan, where she is the assistant professor and the head of vitro retinal department, to give us some insights on what innovations are there for diabetic retinopathy. Dr. Rafin Talpur. I don't see your presentation. I think I see your screen, but not your presentation. Yes. You will need to unmute. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, first of all, sorry for the late uh, joining. 
and uh, thank you very much dear colleague for inviting me on this prestigious platform to deliver my presentation on innovative approach in diabetic retinopathy okay it's uh, uh, before going to my presentation i just give you the brief introduction of my institute in the institute of ophthalmology the only eye care institute in pakistan established through the legislation of provincial assembly of sin by upgrading the status of dhaka university of eye hospital hyderabad during the year 2013 siu is upgraded to the degree awarding institute in the year 2019 Health Department, uh, Government of Sin notified SIUS as an implementation center for sin prevention and control of blindness in the year 2013. SIUS not only offers the patient care service, but it is the best institute in teaching, training, and research in the field of the ophthalmology in sin province. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Yeah, it's a. Uh, I think yeah. If you can move. Yeah. Okay. As you all know, diabetes is one of the fastest rising public health issue. Pakistan has become the third country in the world with the highest number of diabetes. and according to the international diabetic federation 33 millions of people are living with diabetes in pakistan so uh, this is a uh, brief uh, diabetic uh, this chart show the diabetic uh, clinic the 17 month study in which we a uh, total of 6085 patient were screened out of 24.1% had diabetic retinopathy 61% had vision threatening diabetic retinopathy and the laser advised in 24.1% laser done in 83.4% and intravenous injection advised in 435 and intraventral injection done in 85.7% via surgery advised in 18.3% and via surgery then 51.5% take time to switch on another slide okay so this is the conventional method which we do at at ivs for the screening and the treatment of the diabetic retinopathy so first of all patient register and then refraction and vas corrected visual acuity done and then the retinal screening performed with the non midriatic fundus camera and then these patient are divided according to your fundus findings either no diabetic retinopathy these patient refer to the journal of ophthalmologist Or there they uh, either call the patient for the follow up, or the patient have cataract or glaucoma problem. Then they send refer to these patient to the sub specialist clinic. If the patient have diabetic retinopathy, then these patient refer to us in the retina specialist. Over there we uh, diagnose okay, which is which is stage of diabetic retinopathy, and then we offer the treatment like laser treatment. If the patient need laser, we go for the laser intravitreal anti vegf and the VR surgery. Uh, this is the screening and is strengthening of the diabetic retinopathy at the district level so one of the district no sure of uh, pro were chosen over there the diabetic screening performed by involving the paramedic at the basic health unit and then the retinal screening is performed by the help of the optometrist and then these optometrists refer these patient for their stages and identification of the visual threatening diabetic retinopathy to the nearby ophthalmologist and if uh, the diabetic retinopathy service is available uh, over there then the ophthalmologist performs there otherwise the uh, the ophthalmologist refer these patient to the laser center at the secondary level and if these patient need the vr surgery then these patient refer to the tertiary center where the vr department develop awareness of diabetic retinopathy still remains sub optimal among the primary care physician so good communication between the physician and ophthalmologist regarding ocular finding is important so the chain of the partner is to be developed for the better management of the diabetic complication including the diabetic related blindness so diabetologist physician family physician uh, should consult the patient should refer the patient to the ophthalmology and the nephrology 
and ophthalmologist and nephrologist refer back these patients to the diabetologist and the family physician to control their systemic disease. Innovative uh, technology in diabetic retinopathy uh, referral and treatment the community uh, center side patient. The teleophthalmoscopy uh, is one of the uh, good approach and SIUS is strengthening its IT department with the support of the CBMP at the district approach. CBM uh, one peak project in Pakistan, which is uh, currently limited to the screening and the referral for the diabetic retinopathy, but CBM should extend work on providing a one-stop services for the diabetic retinopathy care that provide all essential diabetic related services under one roof at the district level. Artificial intelligence, see, uh, we should, in future, we should work on the implementation and the using of artificial intelligence in establishing the screening, diagnosis, and treatment of the diabetic retinopathy at the district and the talka level. We need, as per year, prevalence of diabetic is increasing. So obviously, diabetic retinopathy is also increased. We, so we need more human resources, like we need more optometrists, social mobilizer, more ophthalmologists, more medical and surgical retina specialists. We need more equipment like the smartphone camera, the non-mediatic fundus camera, which is the effective alternative of direct ophthalmoscopy for examining the fundus. And it is the easier way to detect the ocular finding. Ophthalmologists at the Talka and the district health level, which grade the diabetic retinopathy and then treat them according to their condition, licensed with the tertiary center and good referral chain, functional hospital management information system and monitoring at the PSP cell level by community ophthalmologists under supervision of professor of ophthalmology of nearby tertiary center. A synchronized effort of uh, CBM and the government of uh, uh, since on screening and referral for diabetic retinopathy can support us to create a lasting impact on the lives of millions of people. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, can you please pull back your screen or stop sharing that? Thank you for that. Okay. Sorry for. Barbara, I think you're muted. Okay. Um, can you mute uh, Dr. Thalpur? Thanks. So the cornerstone of the diabetic retinopathy is certainly the collaboration with the physicians and uh, the diabetologists because the glycemic control is key to ensuring that we get the right uh, treatment and results of diabetic retinopathy. Thank you very much. I'll move on to the next uh, session, which is our next part of the session, which is uh, going to be our panelists who I will ask questions. I'm also seeing some questions in Q&A. Please continue to write your questions in Q&A, which I will come to towards the end of the session. I'm going to introduce first all the panelists that are on the panel. And uh, when I take your name, please just wave so that people can know who it is. The first person is uh, Professor Guthoff from the uh, University of Rostock. He is the senior professor of um, ophthalmology at the University of Rostock and he's the chair of the international section of the DOG. So welcome, uh, Rolf. Thank you, Baba. We have uh, 
Dr. Steinmetz, who is the managing director, Carl Zeiss, Meditech, Germany. And uh, Barbara, it's muted again. Let's hope it stays unmuted this time. Yeah. So Mr. Steinmetz is the managing director of the Zeiss Medical Technology segment in Germany and has more than 20 years of experience in different markets and roles in management sales and marketing. Welcome, uh, Mr. Steinmetz. We have uh, Professor Helene Bourgeli from Canada. She's a professor of ophthalmology at the University of Montreal and has been the Dean of the School of Medicine at the University of Montreal. We also have Dr. Brown from the German Ministry of Economic Cooperation and Development, the head of division health politics and financing. So welcome, Dr. Brown. Thank you very much. And we have um, Dr. Aaron Magawa, who is an ophthalmologist and uh, the chair of the International Agency for Prevention of Blindness for Africa and is based in Zimbabwe. So let me start with um, Professor Guthoff. Professor Goodhoff, you represent the profession, the academia, and we would like to know that what academia is doing to advance the eye health for all, especially in the context of international cooperation. And I would really like you to tell us about the cooperation that you have with Kinshasa, which you have spearheaded for many years uh, from University of Rostock. Roll. Thank you, Baba. Yeah, let me conclude all these 20 years. It's very, very essential that you are, you identify the right partners, speak the same language, have a common analysis, is what is needed there under those under local cir social circumstances. I think this is the key. When we went there for 20 years, we had been very enthusiastic and the partners had been very enthusiastic. But um, then we ended up in grassroots working, which we have not expected before. So as an academic, as a representative of our university, we tried to identify local partners, which was partly quite difficult. So we had at the end, we identified local partners very effectively, but uh, what we think academic, which means having a, a clear identification of studies, which may improve the quality, which may improve the process quality, the outcome quality. This is something which took quite a few years, but finally we thought understanding each other and coming very friendly with each other, which obviously seems to be at least as important as it is an, among uh, research in, in, in Europe with partners, then we finally thought it's worthwhile the energy to identify the local needs, but also very much to see what is not possible. I think one of the key issues I found, and I tried to transport also in our National Academy of Science when we talk about these elements, the expectations locally are mostly very high. People travel all over the world, colleagues from there, and they know what is theoretically possible. And one of the key issues, which I think we have to spend time on it by planning, is to identify what is possible to, possible to reduce blindness and which instruments, which potentials do we use and also 
which are not suitable for those local circumstances, which is mainly dealing in our surroundings with surgical retina. This is everybody looking for and asking and asking many questions and we, we very feel with them, but we have to identify maybe a center, maybe not. And uh, in, in areas, this is a mega city of 10 million and the, the only um, surgical retina guy is, is flowing, flow, flowing in from South Africa every now and then and does the upper class people or the upper, upper class people go abroad. It's very, very difficult. And I would like to hear the, the, the opinion of all of our panelists. How do we address the point to, to be to be open minded and helpful as we can, but also to address the limitations? Otherwise, to, to conclude, it was very fruitful to identify things where we can improve the, the, the quality of surgery, where we can include improve the quality of follow up, especially in pediatric cataracts. This also is going very well, but one of the top issues is the one I mentioned, being open-minded and also discussing limitations. Thank you very much, Rolf. Thank you uh, for that insight um, into looking and getting the right partners and then certainly working with them to improve the quality of work that is happening and by producing evidence through research um, which then feeds back into their planning. Uh, my next question is to Dr. Steinmetz, and that is that um, Zeiss has been working with, within the sector of eye health for many years, and we know that uh, the equipment and the right type of equipment is critical in delivering eye health services. So the question to you is, how does Zeiss see its contribution to achieving universal eye health? Dr. Steinmetz. Thank you. Thank you very much for this question, Dr. Qureshi. And also thanks for having me on this panel. Uh, indeed, Zeiss turns 175 years old uh, this year, actually, we celebrate a little. Um, yeah, our mission as a company is basically contrib contribute to the process, progress of medicine overall. Um, to, to reach this, we're trying to, to enable more efficient and cost-effective treatments all over the world. Um, it is very important for us to, to provide access to, to high quality medical care as to many people as, as possible. Um, and to do so, uh, within our product portfolio, we invest heavily in the development of different devices for different market segments and also heavily in the digitalization, the digital technology, just to make sure that the adoption of digitalization is very intuitive and easy. Um, if you take, take those uh, uh, topics a little bit down further, um, you see that uh, globally, we see a lot of different market segments. However, technique and uh, devices need to be very easy to access, but also easy to use and to service. Um, we also see uh, a, a huge potential, and that's why I was really interested uh, in hearing from Dr. Talpur from Pakistan, um, to talk about uh, artificial intelligence. Uh, there are um, uh, projects ongoing for teleretinal tele screening systems, basically to integrate the, the overall patient journey. This is something we are looking into. And of course, we try to optimize the workflows inherent for patient treatments along the treatment chain using data and make, make data uh, use, uh, use of data all over uh, the different steps in the system. That will be something uh, I would like to tell uh, uh, yeah, uh, during this panel. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Steinmetz. Uh, as we begin to um, become so technology dependent on lots of our things and innovations and equipment, one of the key things that we come across is maintenance that how do we maintain all this equipment in environments, in um, places so that they stay functional? Because we, we do end up having lots of equipment, but then 
the maintenance piece is something that's also uh, critical for everyone. Would you just like to make a comment on the maintenance piece, uh, Dr. Steinmetz? Uh, I know Zeiss does quite a bit on that as well. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, it's right, and it's it's not only a topic uh, for for countries we were just talking about. It's also a topic, for example, the the market I represent for Germany. You have so many devices, so many different maturity levels, so many segments you address. It's even hard to find the right pathway through those 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 uh, devices. And what we are looking into is the, to to make the device more easy to access and to run those more from a central platform with regards to remote access on and, and data, and also to make um, devices for for different markets as easy as possible. Uh, for example, to look into Faco, it's an interesting example in my opinion. Faco is very capital intense, so to, to have a cataract procedure with the Faco machine, etc. So it would be interesting to have a device in place which is less capital intense, which is more easy to use. We could, you can have uh, consumables, for example, in place. And those kind of topics are also in, of interest for us just to make sure that each segment gets addressed in the best possible way. However, I, I have to admit it's a really, it's a big challenge for us also, also playing in every country worldwide to address all this kind of different um, uh, topics uh, at the same time. Would that make sense for you? Thank you. Yes, absolutely. Um, and I think uh, uh, since the co the contexts keep differing, the contextualized trainings might be very helpful at different service delivery points. Thank you very much. My next question is to Professor Bojli. Um, you've done a lot of work on gender and the issue of gender and um, we would really love to hear from you what is necessary to reduce the inequality when it comes to gender um, in achieving the universal eye health. So, Professor Bodgley. Thank you, uh, Dr. Kweshi. Uh, I'm happy to join you from Université de Montréal uh, today. Uh, well, it's important um, because uh, eye health is a gender uh, issue uh, as the Lancet uh, Commission has uh, shown, you know, 55% of blind or visually impaired people are women worldwide. Um, in addition, in so many countries, uh, women have a poor access to eye health. And uh, that is at all um, ages during, um, during the life cycle. Um, so very uh, briefly, you know, uh, early on, uh, it, we spoke about uh, refractive errors like uh, myopia. And uh, we know that uh, girls uh, have uh, in many countries less access to education. Well, if you have unequal access to spectacles, uh, this is an added uh, obstacle to education for young women and also um, an obstacle to a very good or good education outcome and ultimately uh, to their future economic uh, independence. Uh, in uh, midlife, uh, we just spoke about diabetic uh, retinopathy. Uh, well, uh, blindness is a, from diabetic retinopathy is a midlife issue, a time where people are very active uh, in, the, in the workforce. So not only uh, equitable uh, access to screening for diabetic retinopathy is important, um, but also all the lifestyle, um, you know, helping people with nutrition programs and uh, healthy lifestyles, uh, lifestyle when, when it is possible, because we have to remember that uh, improving uh, eye health uh, for people with diabetic retinopathy will not only improve um, women, uh, the health of these women, but also improve the workforce with the e economical uh, uh, benefits. But we also have to think about their, their children who are likely to be uh, future uh, diabetics. So um, 
if we can improve, uh, it, it, it will be important. We spoke about uh, these uh, cataract uh, efficiency uh, program, um, which are you know being developed uh, world worldwide, and it will be important uh, to monitor equal access of women to these uh, cataract programs. Uh, Twenty years ago. Um, at University of Montreal and you know the regional health uh, system um, did put forth a, a program and um, we we uh, saw a difference from the 90s uh, to the uh, early uh, 2000 years with regards to access of women to cataract surgery even in a country like Canada now that problem has been uh, solved and um, Earlier on, you know, we uh, spoke about um, uh, people, uh, the, the elderly with the macular degeneration, glaucoma, or past uh, corneal diseases like uh, with uh, tra trachoma or, uh, you know, river blindness that can truly impact um, uh, quality of life. And we showed that people with um, uh, visual impairment limit their life space and have more falls and all the other problems that uh, Matthew uh, Burton uh, spoke about. So in conclusion, um, uh, global health and universal health coverage is not universal unless uh, gender equity is taken into account. Back to, back to you, uh, Baba. Thank you very much. That was very nice, Helene, um, letting us know what and what areas we need to be looking at. I'm going to uh, then ask my next question to Dr. Brown, um, who is from the German Ministry for Economic Cooperation and Development, um, which is also called the BMZ in Germany. Uh, and you certainly um, are part of quite a lot of work that is done. So the question to you is how can development cooperation contribute to, to address some of the challenges that we have heard this morning? Thank you. Um, yes, uh, so first of all, let me be very frank and honest. I'm, I'm not a... Um, um, really expert on the eye um, medical side of the discussion today. But um, we look in the Federal Ministry of Economic Cooperation, um, or we try to look into health in a, in a systematic um, view. So we, we speak a lot about health system strength because we believe that there are many diseases out there that deserve, of course, um, medical attention. And um, we, we think the best way to approach um, the many different uh, topics are really through a systematic approach. So a nurse um, can be of help in a, in a vaccine campaign as we talk a lot about COVID-19 now, but she can also, or he can also perform um, services in a rural area on, for example, um, eye health. So this is why we think the systematic approaches are extremely important. Um, and that is then um, our um, political systematic approach towards achieving universal healthcare coverage. And that we, we don't look at one disease at a time, but really try to create a system that is robust enough to tackle different medical challenges. A, a, a second a general comment I want to make is that we have learned in the discussion around um, sustainable development goals that it's not one group of actors or one actor alone that can achieve long-lasting progress but we need really multi-actor partnerships and this um, discussion today shows this very nicely we need academia we need the private sector we certainly need strong civil society organizations like CBM uh, and we, of course, need, need uh, government um, participation, um, not only about um, 
funding, but also uh, because of the funding that governments can provide. So these, the second aspect of multi-actors partnerships are extremely important. Third and fourth point I briefly want to mention, it's this human rights approach. Uh, we think um, it, it is extremely important to think of health issues as a, a human rights issue. Um, there is an entitlement to well-being and um, health, and out of this um, human rights approach, um, there can become great uh, benefit for uh, for the health system strengthening. And when I say human rights, this of course includes also the aspect of gender equality, and it was mentioned several times that we need to be um, gender sensitive in what we do. So these two elements uh, are very um, closely linked in our in our approach. And last uh, um, issue I wanted to raise is this economic analysis of health. And I found the, the numbers that you presented uh, thrilling, um, but it's um, again also something that we work on a very daily basis, COVID-19. We know the costs of a vaccine, but we know the costs of the damage this pandemic is leading to. And this is a similar case that you were making um, this morning. And I think that is um, not contradicting uh, the human rights approach, uh, but it's it's supplementing it. There is a, a, a right in itself to well-being and healthy lives, but there's also a good sense, sensible economic case behind it. And this needs to be um, sewed together on a political level. Um, I could have mentioned now also the, the projects we support, um, but I thought these more general remarks are maybe from a development point of view, that I, that's what I can um, speak best about, uh, are maybe more helpful to this panel. So um, if there's more time in the second round, I'm happy also to speak more on, on what we do on a concrete level in the project and program funding. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Brown. And I think it might be just be a good point at the moment if you could just mention one or two programs that you actually concretely work on so that the audience gets to know what that would look like in real life. Thank you. Yeah, I'm very happy to do that. We, we have a program um, where we work with German um, hospitals partnering with um, hospitals in um, partner countries, as we say. And there are five uh, German hospitals uh, working with clinics in Malawi, Rwanda, Kenya, Ghana, and India um, on improving eye health. And um, the, the translation of the title is Partners Strengthen Health. Health, um, in German, it's uh, Klinik Partnerschaften, so it's clinical partnerships. And um, um, for example, the University of Tübingen is involved um, in one project with Malawi that I mentioned, um, but um, that's, that's one example. Then through our civil society um, funding um, streams, we work with CBM. Um, and that is, as I mentioned, one, one example where um, civil societies um, come in as a important implementing actor of um, health projects. Thank you very much. That's um, really very kind of you actually alluding to the different um, areas that we need to be looking at strengthening and then actually putting it down into concrete terms. I will then move on to Dr. Aaron Magawa. Um, Dr. Magawa, uh, you've been an ophthalmologist. You've, uh, in the Southern African hemisphere, and you've been the chair for IAPB Africa for quite some time. What do you think has to happen that eye health gets integrated as part of universal health coverage and especially the national health systems. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Baba, um, for having me here. Now, 
the first thing that we have to do is to celebrate our success as a sector. Uh, we have been having the Vision 2020 uh, you know, agenda, and that has achieved a lot. So we have to learn from it, as well as you know, use it uh, to um, prop prop propagate ourselves going, going forward. Now, there is also a lot of information, as other speakers have, have, they, they have said, uh, evidence and data. We also have to use that. So the way we can use that is, is in this manner. You know, we have to increase the awareness, uh, you know, in understanding of eye health uh, amongst other people. So the non-eye health people have to understand exactly what we are about and what exactly we are trying to achieve. So we have to work outside our sector and look at the non-traditional partners to move us, you know, forward as well. For this, like I said before, we have to use the evidence and the data which we have generated. But going forward, we also have to generate even more data, especially operational data, so that when we put our, across our, our, you know, our case, we have got enough to convince the people uh, you know, who actually are responsible for providing health, especially in the political arena. I come to the second point, which is related to, to what I've just been saying in terms of financing the health sector activities. So we need commitments, uh, you know, from the governments, you know, the Ministry of Health, uh, the uh, Economic and Finance Ministry, so that there is more money made available, you know, for, for the sector. And for this to happen, you know, we all we have to continue to look at eye health, you know, not as just as prevention of blindness, but is as a political agenda, a social agenda, as well as an economic agenda to say to the governments, um, if you provide proper eye health, there is going to be a return in terms of the investment in which the, the, the particular government has put in into this sector. Now, that goes on to another point on how to re exactly we work on the ground. So currently we have got situations where eye health is actually uh, you know, delivered in a silo mechanism where uh, it's a vertical program rather than, uh, you know, a horizontal program. So we have to change that as well. So systems in country have to, uh, you know, be changed in terms of policy dialogues, which translate into policies themselves, uh, the health strategic plans, which include eye health strategic plans. And then we make sure that these plans don't just stay on the shelves, but they're actually op operationalized at the district level uh, when it comes to you know, the, country, the countries or member countries uh, in, in question. We also have to look at what hinders the actual you know, um, for provision sometimes in terms of the cost to the, to the uh, you know, patients or our communities. So rules have to be changed on the grounds rules around tax, because in most places, I wear a pair of spectacles is treated as a luxury. So that has systems or laws have changed, you know, around that. Now, you know, as a sector, you know, coming from the IAPB side, we have actually come together as partners or partnerships to try and see how we can actually move. So currently we've got uh, you know, a strategy we now have in place is called 2020 Insight. This is looking at those aspects uh, you know, where I've just talked about. So we have got a strategic plan is IAPB, which is set you know, to elevate the level of eye health with policy, with, with policy makers, integrate it into the um, you know, general health uh, system, as well as create a demand from the people on the ground. So we drive the demand for eye health from the bottom upwards as well. Thank you very much, Baba. Thank you, Aaron. Thank you, that was a very good example and um, happy that you referred to the IAPB's um, strategy 2030 insight. I think we have um, and are seeing quite a lot of um, not only 
global uh, commitments, but actually action in the field um, by implementing these uh, different um, strategies. And thank you, Aaron, for that. Um, I have a couple of questions coming in Q&A. I have a hand up from Alakos. Alakos, please. Thank you, Baba, because I'm, I'm, I want to take advantage of this dialogue, actually to ask two questions to the two panelists, um, um, Dr. Browne and also um, Herr Steinmetz. The first one to Dr. Browne, uh, because you, you, you put two examples of what you are doing to support the area of eye care. My question is to what extent these kind of strategies are sustainable in the long run? And the question is what needs to happen so that that what Germany invest in health system strengthening also include in an explicit way or the more that it has been so far in eye care. So that is the question for you, Dr. Brown. And now for um, her Steinmetz. And again, it is also the question of sustainability. Huh? You brought the example um, also in the response of the question that it was posed in the chat, that you are supporting also training and the distribution of devices. But my question is again, how you make sure that these activities are sustainable in the long run? Because perhaps you are promoting models that make the country or the city or the community extremely dependent of devices and training that it is not sustainable in the long run. So what is also the thinking in terms of sustainability? Thank you. Thank you, Baba. Thank you, Alako. So let's uh, have Dr. Brown first, and then I'll come to Dr. Steinmetz. So Dr. Brown. Yes, thank you. It's an excellent question. And of course, sustainability of our financial contributions is an overall aim. Um, and I cannot um, say that we always achieve it, um, of course, because sometimes we know that funding cycles are too short to really have a, a so long lasting uh, systematic effect in a certain environment. And so therefore, uh, we in the Ministry of Development Cooperations um, try to think in, in more year cycle. Yeah? And that is something that distinguishes us from other ministries that are maybe more uh, drawn to short term effects. But we take that very serious. Um, how, how can we uh, be sure that um, we are on the road towards sustainability? in our financing. And, and I would really say that um, uh, the answer to that lies in our approach of making health system strengthening our, in German we say leitmotiv, our main theme in, in every intervention. So I, I mentioned the, the vaccine example um, where we have um, a, a specific short-term goal, vaccine as many people as possible. Um, but in doing so, we, we finance um, structures that are then there for other uh, medical uh, issues as well. And we do that, for example, also in the world, uh, work with the Global Fund uh, or the, the clinic projects that I mentioned. We, we always try to make sure that people look beyond the short-term effect and try to look into the program more holistically. And to be more specific on your question, why don't we address eye health as a, as a, as a, that's my understanding, as a separate important issue? That would be a little bit, um, I would argue, even contradicting um, yeah, when, we, when we say this is a systematic approach that we try to fund, uh, but please look into this challenge or that challenge specifically, then it, it contradicts a little bit the system. Yeah, however, the, the question was uh, so implicitly integrating, uh, so that is, you make sure that it is integrated into your health system strengthening 
uh, approaches. So it was not, of course, the issue of parallel system, the, rather the opposite. Really, you make okay. sure that it is integrated and it is not left apart. So that, that was the question. Thank you. I see. Okay, I see. Maybe I misunderstood. Yeah. Dr. Steinmetz. Yeah, thank you. Thank you also for this question. Well, um, in general, we take medical device regulation very, very seriously. That means different markets with different maturity levels also require different uh, levels of service. So if you take, for example, the markets who are very, which are very mature, we have, of course, a direct service and support organization. Those markets who have not this maturity levels, we are, we are working together with dealers. And the markets with low income uh, situations, basically, we are working together with Christopher Blinton, uh, Blind Mission, uh, um, to make sure that uh, the resources we acquire are, are really um, addressed in the best possible manner. So what I just uh, answered the question here, that, that's a training center which is supported by CBM and where we also make sure that, that the initiatives are there, long lasting, uh, and that not, not what you mentioned, just be, that would just spill out products into markets and then do not uh, make sure who, who is then able to support them. So uh, this is kind of the way we, we see this. Uh, I hope I could answer, answer your question accordingly. Thank you, Dr. Steinmetz. Thank you very much. Um, I will come back to Rolf. Uh, I've got a question from, got quite a lot of questions. So the first question, um, Matthew, I think goes probably to you. Where do you see bottlenecks in the integration of eye care with universal eye care and what can be done to overcome them? Uh, thank you. Uh, it's a really, really crucial question. Um, I think um, it operates at multiple levels, and I think I think we have to be thinking about the problem um, in in many different places and, and in different direct dimensions. So it starts off at the sort of like the policy piece, and you know one of the key things that I think the sector has seen a great leap forward with the leadership in WHO, the World Health Assembly, and the UN General Assembly resolution is that very high level political engagement with this and that is that is really key because everything else can then begin to cascade down from that i believe um the um the integration of uh, uh financing of eye health financing within the general health financing systems these obviously are very diverse and vary tremendously between different countries between different world regions but but in so many uh, core eye health services, whether it's things like cataract surgery, for example, are not really covered. And so that, that's a, a lot of work needs to be done around thinking through how, in a context specific manner, eye health can be integrated into the standard health financing mechanisms in a country. So, so that, the, the, that that aspect is dealt with. And then we need to kind of, kind of link to that policy piece and the national plans is begin to, integrate eye health as an inter integral part of the general health workforce training right from day one in medical school well not day one but you know early on in, in medical and, and nursing training um and and for that broader cadre the generalist to see the eyes as part of the body that they actually ought to know something about and be able to help and respond to um so so in it's important to kind of integrate training from an early stage and then the the, the big piece, of course, is, is what Alakos touched on right at the end of her talk, which is integrated person-centered eye care. And again, this is a context-specific thing. And, you know, obviously, we've got the different elements that are, are coming together at the moment through those different packages that WHO is leading uh, the, the development of. But countries are going to need to think through how, how do we, in our context, make this operate, an operational reality? How do we connect eye care? care services to the people that need them? How do we how do we ensure that people are not left behind? So I think it's, it's multi-dimensional. It, it's, it's partly about the money, it's partly about the policy, it's partly about the workforcing, but then there's a, a very, very key piece right at the middle, which is how do we integrate this? And it goes across different sectors. It's not just health, it's education, it's, it's, it's employment. You know, what are the workplace changes that can be made to make it safer for people's eyes? Yeah, there's all sorts of things like that. Um, 
that, that need to be thought of across, across the whole sector. I think that partly answers the question. Big, big question. Thank you, Matthew. Thank you very much. Uh, Rolf. Yeah, just following this, this conversation, it was mentioned that we're talking about a horizontal and a vertical kind of development. This brings me to my academic job. Uh, the horizontal one has shown that including community-based rehabilitation is, uh, sorry, it, it really brings us many, many advantages. So the society as a whole has to be involved. And this can be also used as an academic tool to understand how social sciences work in this regard. And being on a vertical point, when we say science, how does it help us? When we interact with our colleagues and friends, they are helping them to write together papers in peer reviewed journals. It also brings people together. And we, we went, took them to the Arvo, we took them to German, of course, German meetings and to the American Academy. This raises interest of more people than we thought in the beginning. So the horizontal and the vertical elements of academic work is really something we should take care of intensively, as mentioned before. Thank you very much, Rolf. Thank you. Very, very important and very critical in our work. Um, I have a, another question and maybe Aaron, um, you could look at this. It's a very important question again, that are the local health workers ready to deliver integrated health services? And how is the fluctuation, how is the fluctuation experience, especially on the community level for early screenings? And the question is quite large, but what can we do to increase readiness on this key power to solve problems in holistic health system on a local level? Thank you uh, very much, uh, Baba. Now, when we look at you know, the health workforce, uh, we should probably look at it from uh, by looking at other departments, you know, of health who are who also, uh, you know, um, are there in the community. Now, I'll take an example of hypertension, for example. Hypertension is taken care of by the nurse, right at the, from the clinic level, right up to the tertiary level. Now, that has not been happening, you know, smoothly with, um, you know, uh, eye health. So we have to change. So non-eye health people should actually be involved in the delivery of eye health care. So like you mentioned, uh, rightly mentioned, Baba, we start at the community. So already in most countries, there are village health workers or community workers. We should also make sure that in their curriculum, there is the eye health sex, uh, part when they are actually being, being, being taught. So, that will make sure that we actually expand our capabilities inside the communities in terms of how much health, I have knowledge or treatment or delivery can be done at those levels. So we move away from working as I help people on our own, but teach our other counterparts what we actually need them to deliver you know, to the people. So integrate, you know, effectively on the eye health, on the, on the health worker uh, spectrum uh, in, in, in country. Thank you, Baba. Thank you very much. I think that, you, yeah, you answered the question quite nicely. It's a, it's a very big question. And uh, to be honest, it, it would require quite a lot of discussion. Looking at time, we just have two minutes left. And I think I would uh, like to, do two things in these two minutes. One is to conclude the session. But before I do that, I would really like to thank all the presenters, all the panelists, all the participants of this session. And I sincerely hope that you were able to gain quite an insight into what global commitments currently look like what do we see and what do we look at going forward to 2030, looking at SDGs, looking at the whole eye care in the development perspective. 
and in a multi-stakeholder perspective. And then we should not remember that the action will always have to happen at the countries. That's where we would need a lot of evidence. We would need a lot of advocacy. We would need a lot of input from all stakeholders working in the country with the leadership being with the government, with the government driving the whole agenda and all the stakeholders taking on a lot of partnership and working with them to achieve all the SDGs by 2030. With that, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to thank you all and specifically one person who has worked and done a huge amount of work and that's Mariam Maya from CDM that has really worked together to put this program and has made it a success. With that, I thank you all and I wish you a very good day. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Goodbye.